All right, here we go. And then here's a chat for us. I don't know if you can see that, but um, all right. So we are live on YouTube right now. I, I let's see. I don't see the chat yet, but I definitely see, I see that we're live. It says now playing. How do I? Oh right, that's the twenty second delay. I forgot about that. Oh yeah, I see that there's a chat. Did you, I didn't? I don't see anything in the chat yet, but it says "Welcome to Live Chat." Got it. Okay, and I don't have my phone. Um, you know, I was gonna say I can, let me go get my phone and I can yeah. Facebook Live this really fast. All right, so it is going to be, it's so we have, uh, it's just six o'clock right now. So I'm yeah. just gonna go on Facebook and I'm going to just do a quick little live cause that's where people are. Hey, 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 everybody. I am here and I am getting ready to interview Dr. Greg Pauly with the Natural History Museum about his awesome book that he collaborated on, which is called Wild LA. It's very exciting stuff. You need to join us on the YouTube channel if you wanna see this interview because we can't share this screen on Facebook. So um, I will see you on the YouTube channel as soon as you can get there. We'll see you soon. Bye bye. All right. Maybe that will help remind people that we're here. Yeah. And in the meantime, here we are. I am so glad you had some time to join us tonight. What about this weather? Oh my goodness. I can't even, I feel like this day is so surreal. <laughs> is it day? Is it night? I feel like we're waiting. Every time I look outside, I think it's just going to be raining. It's so dark outside. I feel like it, it, it just, it just feels reminiscent of a storm system moving through and and I guess in some ways there is a storm moving through, but it's not the kind of storm that we want to be dealing with. No, no, it's crazy. Just when you think you're, you've reached the uh, limit of all the crazy things that can go wrong, then now you got smoke in the sky. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. My phone, and that's another thing. <laughs> Whenever I'm live on YouTube, my phone rings. It's it's. Like, <laughs> it's probably people calling to say, "Wait, am I supposed to be on Facebook or YouTube show? or Zoom?" But I, I see on, on the YouTube channel, I see we do have a few people. We have a handful of people who are there on the channel now, so. Yeah, that's exciting. Right. Yay, everybody's coming on in. Nice, nice, nice. I love it. Well, I can't see the names of the people who are on the YouTube channel, but I know that some of the people that registered on Facebook are people that are, some of them are community scientists and some are uh, people who have volunteered with me and been out and done some field work with me in the past. So um, I know there's a handful of, uh, there's at least a few friends on there is my guess. Um, I love it. That's awesome. That is awesome. And we have some 
regular viewers that like to come on Thursday nights and just see what Taranga Ranch is up to. So between the two of them, who knows what's going on, but I'm really excited to welcome uh, some new people and some people who are coming back to our Thursday night 6 p.m. regular live program. And we have been bringing you so many different things over the past few months. Um, and it's been changing and it's super exciting. Um, and the latest thing that we're doing is these super awesome interviews with some of the most amazing people I know. And uh, I'm really, really excited um, about tonight. Tonight is Dr. Greg Polly, and he is one of the authors of this awesome book, Wild LA. And um, I'm gonna read his little bio. Um, first, I'm just gonna say what, what uh, before I even get started, this book is awesome. I love it. Um, it's got some really cool hand-drawn maps for field trip locations. It has interesting facts about local animals. Everybody knows how I feel about that. There's history of the area that sort of pulls it all together. Photos and just the whole urban ecology that's happening here. So I am really excited to talk about this book. Um, Dr. Greg Polly is the curator of herpetology and co-director of the Urban Nature Center Urban Nature Research Center at the Natural History Museum of LA County. His research since joining the museum in 2012 has focused on the impacts of urbanization on wildlife. He is an advocate for community science and believes partnerships between professional scientists and community members can revolutionize scientific research. His fieldwork has involved studying frogs in tropical rainforests, lizards in the Mojave Desert, and introduced geckos across Southern California neighborhoods. He has authored or co-authored numerous scientific publications, including several with community science co-authors. So with that, I am going to turn it over to you, Dr. Polly. Thank you well, for coming. Oh, thanks much. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me out. And thanks to everybody who has uh, joined on the YouTube live this evening. I hope some of you will have have checked out have checked out the book, um, and maybe we'll have some questions that we can get to uh, later on. Um, so I think let's see. I think I'll go ahead and share my screen now and just give a quick introduction to the book. Oh yes. Okay. All right. Let's see. All right, hopefully we can now see my screen here, which is just a, a quick introduction to Wild LA. So um, the, the Wild LA book is a book that was authored by uh, four different people. Um, two of us, myself and Leela Higgins, work at the Natural History Museum. And then we had two outside authors and those familiar with sort of LA area science writing and natural history writing will recognize these names. So Jason Goldman, um, uh, did a lot of work on some of the introductory chapters. And then Charles Hood uh, not only did, uh, not only was a writer for the book, but also is responsible for a huge number of the photographs. So he really enjoys, um, he really enjoys photography and, and using photos to sort of communicate exciting stories about nature in the Los Angeles area. Um, and I've included here social media handles for me and for Leela as well, um, as well as our emails at the Natural History Museum if you want to follow us on any of those social media channels. So one of the things that um, I think, one, I mean, one of the big motivations for the book and one of the things that I really get excited about in the Los Angeles area is that LA is truly an amazing place. Like when we, we talk to people about, or when you ask your friends, like, why are you visiting LA? They'll say things like, oh, I wanted to see the beach or I wanted to check out Hollywood. Um, you know, I wanted to see the Hollywood sign in Griffith Park. I wanted to go to Disneyland. And there's all these reasons that people give that have nothing to do with nature. And what I would actually argue is that people should be coming to Los Angeles 
specifically because of the amazing nature here. And all of us who have the opportunity to be living here in Los Angeles, this is something that we should be truly proud about. Like when we go like visit family elsewhere, you know, we're off on Thanksgiving, we're off on Christmas visiting family. Like the thing that we should be telling them about is like the amazing nature that is all around us here in Los Angeles and the amazing nature stories that are that are here. So maybe some people are like, uh, you know, I don't know about that. I mean, it's hard to say all this today, right? When we've we've got these sort of smoke filled skies as we're dealing with this, this sort of incredible um, wildfires right now. But let's like take a step back and just think about some of the big claims to fame that we have um, here in LA. So uh, normally if I'm able to do this in front of a live audience, then I get people to raise their hands. And I'm just gonna tell you that as I ask these questions, if you feel like you didn't know that factoid about LA, don't worry, because normally when I ask people to raise their hands, very few people do. So these are oftentimes factoids that people don't know, but these are the factoids that we should be just telling you know, everybody who will listen, everybody who's stuck in an elevator with us and therefore has to listen, your family members that are obligated to listen over Thanksgiving, these are the factoids to tell them. So number one, um, for this and obvious for this picture here. So Los Angeles is the only city in the United States with a major mountain range running through it. And that's of course due to the Santa Monica mountains. Um, so that's, I think a pretty interesting factoid. Like we have a major mountain range bisecting our city. Uh, LA County, this is of course a classic view of LA County. This is, if you ever have a chance to be, if you're ever in the Baldwin Hills area, um, right after a storm has gone through the area, this is the kind of photo that you have the opportunity to get. So LA County has the greatest difference between its lowest and highest points of any county in the United States. So we go from sea level to 10,064 feet at the top of Mount Baldy. So of course what that means is what within that range from sea level up to really subalpine habitat, of course there's this huge, you know, huge variety of habitats that various species um, can then thrive in. So again, cool factoid about LA. Um, third factoid about LA is that LA is the birdiest county in the country. Um, we have over 500 recorded species of birds in LA County. How do we get so many? Well, of course we have huge numbers of native species. We have lots of non-native species that have been introduced and each of those introduced species has an amazing story to tell about how it showed up here and how it's managing to live here. And then we have um, lots of visitors passing through as they migrate along the Pacific coast. So native species, non-native species, species moving through with migration, uh, birdiest county in the country. So I know birdiest, that's probably uh, not a word that people are, are used to thinking about, but we are the birdiest county in the country. Okay, so there's, there's three big LA claims to fame. Um, fourth one, this is actually my favorite. Um, you know, Californians often brag that they can you know, ski and surf in the same day, but LA area naturalists can brag too, because you can see wild bighorn sheep and green sea turtles in the same day, and actually you can see them in the exact same watershed. So you can go, you can drive up Highway 39 up into the San Gabriel Mountains and you can see bighorn sheep um, up in the San Gabriels and then turn around and all in the same watershed, drive back down to the base of the San Gabriel River um, in Long Beach. And we actually have a resident population of green sea turtles. So pretty much all year round in the lower San Gabriel River, you have a good chance of seeing green sea turtles. That is the northernmost resident population of green sea turtles in the um, Eastern Pacific. So, I mean, this is like, you know, hey, if people want to come here to go to Disneyland, that's fine. But, you know, the, before you go to Disneyland or the day after, do something truly spectacular. Go see a bighorn sheep and a green sea turtle. Try to see those in the same day. And it's totally doable. And we actually tell you how to do it um, in the book. We can't guarantee you that you'll have success, but it is doable. Um, so those are just, I think, four amazing facts that I hopefully just get people to realize that the biodiversity in and around Los Angeles is truly amazing. So the question that we always sort of get is like, okay, well, what, what motivated you to write, to write the book? And um, the, the deeper time story of how we came to writing this book is that all of us at the Natural History Museum um, who do, you know, people in the community science office, people in the Urban Nature Research Center, um, where I'm the co-director, uh, you know, curators who are working on urban biodiversity, what we all realize is that every species that's here has an absolutely amazing story to tell. If you think about the recent history of LA, 
you think about LA over the last sort of two to 300 years, it's this unbelievably rapid transformation as we've gone from, uh, you know, the, as the population has rapidly increased, you, in the middle 1800s, you get these major changes as people introduce large amounts of grazing to the region, mostly cattle grazing. And then that transitions to agriculture and then that transitions to massive amounts of urban development. So in a span of really only about 170 years or so, you go from maybe 100,000 or so people in the greater LA area to 18.6 million. It's just this incredibly rapid change. And so what that means is that every species that has experienced that change has an amazing story to tell about you know, how it's managing to survive in this rapid the changing environment. Of course, in some cases, these species are doing incredibly well. If you think about introduced species, they have an amazing story to tell about how they got here and how they're thriving in these urban environments. So that's one of the things that we just realized is that there's so much, there's so many amazing nature stories to tell. And we wanted to, to tell some of those stories as well. And so about 10 years ago, we realized we had this opportunity to convert at the Natural History Museum, we had this opportunity to convert about three and a half acres of hardscape into a nature and teaching garden. And that is now, um, this is, these pictures are from a few years ago. All of those trees are much bigger now, but this is the nature gardens at the museum. And so we were very excited about sort of welcoming nature, you know, right in the heart of Los Angeles, you know, right here in Exposition Park. And in 2013, uh, we opened up uh, a new exhibit. This is a permanent exhibit called the Nature Lab. Um, and in the Nature Lab, we try to tell as many of these amazing stories as we possibly can. So these are actually our community science tables here. And in the community science tables, uh, those are all stories from members of the community, their stories about interesting discoveries and interesting observations that they've made. And then elsewhere in the exhibit, we tell other stories about you know, wildlife uh, surviving and sometimes, oftentimes thriving in the Los Angeles area. And so at the same time as we were developing sort of these exhibits, this indoor outdoor experience, we also were developing a lot of community science. And, and many people know the name community science as citizen science. We prefer the much more inclusive term community science. We developed a community science office. Leela is the head of that. We also developed this urban nature research center where we now have uh, four, five curators um, uh, who are all part of the urban nature research center. There's about a total of about 10 scientists from collections managers, assistant collections managers, postdocs, curators, all working. And we do a lot of this community science work. And so community science is simply projects in which volunteers partner with scientists to answer real world questions. And so we have this amazing network of community scientists who are participating in this research experience. And so all of that was happening. And really, you know, this book was kind of the next step for us in thinking about, you know, how do we communicate to a really broad audience about the amazing biodiversity, the amazing nature that surrounds us here in Los Angeles. And that's really where the book came in. Um, this is the start of the book. So from start to finish, like sort of the first conversation until March, 2019, when the book, book was published, that was almost five years. Um, so this is Charles Hood here. Uh, oftentimes seen on, we, every single field trip we went to, every single, single field trip we talked about in the book, we went there as a group uh, at least once. We oftentimes went there multiple times on our own. Um, and so these are some pictures from that, uh, those, those various field trips. This is Charles Hood. Our managing editor uh, is Kristen, was Kristen Frederick. She worked in the marketing and communications group at the Natural History Museum and was just an amazing asset um, on, this, uh, on this project. Um, so what, for those of you who haven't yet seen the book, um, just to give you a quick intro to sort of what the book looks like, um, the basic, the, ba the book is basically in like three chunks. And the first chunk of the book, the first third of the book are these sort of introductory chapters, these sort of background chapters on sort of the ecology and natural history of Los Angeles. And our goal in writing this book was that you could open the book at any page and start reading and you would instantly learn something you know, very so, something that we thought we hoped would be interesting. So we never wanted to have you open it up and have it be text from top left to bottom right. So there's lots of photos. Um, there's lots of these little call outs and factoids so that you can, you know, if you're only, if you've only got 20 seconds, you can go to one of these little call outs and read that. Um, so these introductory chapters are sort of short and hopefully very fun with lots of fun little factoids and stories throughout. 
Um, we then have a, a sort of second third of the book is 101 species accounts. Um, and we tried to cover a huge variety of species. So we chose in some cases species that are really easy to spot in ID. So things that you can definitely go out and see on a regular basis. But we also wanted to choose species that are more aspirational, things that are gonna be harder to find like a bighorn sheep or a green sea turtle or a mountain lion. Um, so those are all in there as well as species that are a little bit more challenging to find, but still right here in the LA area. Now, of course, if you have 101 species, it means that a huge chunk of those years of prepping for this book was really about, you know, these horrible arguments and debates that we would have to have about which species we would cut um, to try to get it down to that 101, which is, I mean, there's so many wonderful species that we get to talk about in other parts of the book, but we didn't get to include as species accounts. But we also wanted to make sure that we had lots of diversity so that people could read about slime molds and lichens and mushrooms and snails and slugs, in addition to things like, you know, mammals and, and birds, the more common species that we see in field guides. And then the last third, and this is, Dana already mentioned these amazing sketches that we have. The last third of the book are these 25 recommended um, uh, trips. And, and we had the amazing Martha Rich um, joined us for this part of the project. And she made these amazing um, sketch maps at the start of every single uh, trip. So our goal with these trips was that they would be spread out all across the LA area, no matter where you live in the LA area. And we are sort of saying LA area is kind of the LA and San Gabriel River watersheds. So wherever you are in that area, that one of these trips is within say 20 minutes of you. Um, we tried to make them all free. Some of them were only free on certain days or during certain events, but we tried to make them really accessible. Wide diversity of habitats, you know, again, everything from the coast up into the San Gabriel mountains. And we also wanted them to be really accessible to a really broad audience. So we mostly focus on places that are family friendly, have relatively easy walks and hikes. But we also have some that are slightly, you know, that there might be some of that, like a picnic ground and fun stuff to see around the picnic ground, but also maybe a jumping off spot for longer trips like Malibu Creek State Park, for example. So that's, that's the, the big, that's the quick, the 10 minute overview of the book. It's nice to be giving this talk sort of a year uh, it's more than a year after the book was published. Um, you know, if I can say that, you know, I can say whatever I want positive about the book. And if you don't believe me, the beauty is I can now just say, you know, go check out the reviews um, on Amazon or check out some reviews online and you can see more about it. Um, we're very fortunate that the book has been um, well received. Um, I think it's got a 4.9 rating and I don't know, 50 or 60 reviews, something like that on Amazon. So um, you don't have to just believe me that, you know, it's being well received. You can check out those reviews and, and see for yourself. Um, um, and so it's certainly been fun to see it doing well over the, over the past year. So with that, I'll, I'll stop this. Um, so I'll stop the screen sharing and I'll turn this back over to Dana. Um, change host. All right, look at and that. Can, That's amazing. Okay, and so then I can stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Although honestly, oh, all my questions are answered. I'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> so we did have a comment from Wendy Gladstone. She said um, she loves the Nature Garden at Exposition Park, and she thinks it's an excellent idea. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. I love it too, and. Um, I actually was in the nature gardens yesterday uh, for a new project that I'll talk about in a little bit, a project called Widow Wars. And I was actually running around the nature garden looking for brown widows yesterday and, and their prey items. And it was super fun to be able to walk outside my office and immediately start collecting data for a research project. So um, I love the nature garden. It's just an amazing spot. Yeah, that's, yeah. Okay, we have another comment. Hi, Rebecca. Rebecca is saying, I wonder, was Greg involved in designing the live animal exhibits in the Nature Lab at Natural History Museum? I particularly love the urban looking exhibits like the gecko and the ants. Yes, I was, in, I, well, so I was involved in choosing which stories we would tell. I wasn't necessarily involved in the decisions of exactly what those habitats would look like. Um, but there was a whole team of us involved in, in, in all of this. Um, but certainly that gecko story, the, 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 the Mediterranean house gecko exhibit, that's actually a story, I probably can't pull up the page number very quickly, but it's also that story we tell here in the book. 
And the reason we tell that story in the book is that uh, that was just such a powerful story for a lot of us at the museum. So the story, the background here is that uh, back in 2000 and, uh -oh, can I do this off the top of my head? I think it was 2011. Um, a, a nine-year-old boy up in Chatsworth was at a bar, he's with his family. He was at a barbecue at a friend's house and saw a lizard run by uh, along the, basically along the, along the wall, along the, the, yeah, basically along the lower part of the wall of this house that he was at. And he ran over and he caught it. His dad said to him, his name is Reese Bernstein. And his dad, uh, Will said, Reese, did you just catch a lizard? And Reese, again, who was nine said, it's not a lizard dad, it's a gecko. Now, technically geckos are lizards, but like way to go nine-year-old Reese to identify that he just caught a gecko. And so it turned out that that gecko was actually a Mediterranean house gecko, which is one of these non-native species that's been introduced to Southern California. And that, so, so he let folks know at the museum, people at the museum said, oh, well, they, I wasn't hired at the museum yet. There wasn't a herpetologist here. So we contacted a, a, a herpetologist at CSU Northridge who's involved a lot at the museum. And he said, oh, well, go back out and figure out, is this an established population or is this just a few individuals, like one individual that maybe got you know, moved there, like somebody moved into the neighborhood and this gecko came with them in a U-Haul box or something. And so Reese and his dad went back out a couple days later and saw a whole bunch more. And so we realized that that was this established population. And that was actually the very first documented established population of this species in LA County. And so when I started at the museum, um, Bobby Espinoza, who's the researcher at CSU Northridge, and myself and Reese and his dad, well, we worked to write up a little, a little note that basically documents that this is the first you know, population established in LA County. And so Reese at the age of 12 actually became published in the peer reviewed scientific literature all because he you know, caught this lizard and took these photos. And so for me, I started at the museum in 2012. And for me, as I worked with the Bernsteins on that story, it just made me realize that we scientists, no matter how much we look, we are never going to find these many of these species that are in people's backyards. So if you want to study biodiversity in urban areas, it means you have to go about it in a different way. And in particular, what you can do is you can simply ask people to like pull out their smartphones and digital cameras and take photographs of what they see and upload those to platforms like iNaturalist. And that's basically what Reese did. iNaturalist, we, he didn't do it on iNaturalist. We weren't promoting iNaturalist at that point. He actually emailed it directly to the museum as part of a, uh, an earlier project um, called the Los An uh, Lost Lizards of Los Angeles. Um, but it just, it just highlighted to me how important that community science effort was. And so that's why, I know this is like a long-winded answer, but that's why the gecko story is in the nature lab um, but yeah, all of those, all the live animal exhibits in the nature lab, that's because there was, you know, somebody on the nature lab team, you know, a curator at the museum or somebody in our live animal program who just said, this is such a powerful story. We have to tell it. Um, such an important story in the LA area. So that's how those critters ended up in the nature lab. I love it. That is a great story. Um, all right. How about... Okay, so I had a question about community science, but I feel like you answered that. Um, you started by talking about LA being a biodiversity hotspot. I'm wishing you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah, um, this is another, this is another, I think, really important fact that people in the LA area and people throughout much of California should be really excited about. So here in Los Angeles, we live within a biodiversity hotspot. So this hotspot is called the California Floristic Province. It, it runs roughly from sort of, you know, northern Baja, California, throughout much of the state of California, west of the mountains, so west of the Sierra Nevada. Um, so it doesn't include the deserts, even though there's tons of cool stuff going on in the desert. Now, being a biodiversity hotspot is a bit of a mixed bag. So to be a biodiversity hotspot, and there's 36 of them around the globe, like including places like Madagascar and Papua New Guinea. I mean, these places that you're just like National Geographic cover photos, like that's us, like that's us. We're there too, that's us. Um, so we should, we should be excited about that. But it's, again, it's a mixed bag because there's two components to being a biodiversity hotspot. A, lots of biodiversity. And the way that it's 
it's actually defined is that within that specific region, there has to be 1500 plant species that occur there and nowhere else in the world. So we call those endemics, meaning that they occur in that place and nowhere else. So here in California, in the California Floristic Province, we have over 1500 endemic plant species. And if you have lots of plants, endemic plant species, you also have lots of endemic insects and you know, lichens and mosses and amphibians and birds. There's all, all of this, you know, across these various taxa, the levels of endemicity are strongly correlated. So lots of biodiversity here. So that's great. That's one component of the definition. That's the positive component. The next component is a little bit sad. The next component is that, and the reason that you're a hotspot is because it means that you have to be a hotspot, you have to have had at least 70% of the original habitat has been lost. And so of course that's the case here. And that's true across much of California. I mean, just think about the Central Valley, right? You went from a place that was relatively wet, lots of uh, freshwater marshlands, um, rolling hills, oak grassland with native, mostly with native bunch grasses, vernal pool, wetlands, et cetera. You know, and that's now all ag. Um, you think about the LA area, heavy ranching in the mid 1800s, then agriculture, particularly citrus ag, and then le massive levels of urbanization. So, you know, massive amounts of habitat loss. And so that's why we're a biodiversity hotspot. But what it means is that as Angelino is like, we have this amazing opportunity to still see incredible amounts of biodiversity. But it also means, I, I hope that it means that we also have a lot of responsibility for moving towards a future where a lot of those species are not as threatened as they are right now. Um, that, so in other words, how do we move away from that hotspot side of the definition? So obviously we're not gonna be able to reclaim huge amounts of habitat to deal with like lowering that 70% habitat loss number, but we can certainly make lots of decisions in urban areas that maybe make our urban areas more welcoming to native species. Okay, the census is calling me right now. I already counted, I'm counted. <laughs> guys, make sure you're counted too. It's important stuff. Okay. Um, oh, I definitely, I'm going to turn it back to you again because I want to learn more about um, your iNaturalist projects. So oh, yeah. I know that you had the Rascals project that you were doing that I also think is still super cool and I wanna to talk to people about that. But also there's a new project going on about widows and I really wanna yeah. hear more about that. So I should, I mean, I didn't even think about this, but I, I, can I, how quickly can I find it? Cause we actually have widows in the book. Can I get to that page quickly? Um, oh, I should there, yellow garden spider. Um, where are our widows? Oh, there's so many fun insects in this book. Um, hang on, one more, one more page. Oh, I'm not finding the page right now. Um, hey, I found have... it. Oh, it's there. 126. There, I was like, I... why was I missing it? There it is. Oh, I just, I don't know why I missed it. I managed to go right past it. There it is. The pressure, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, there it is. There's our brown. There's our brown and black widows. And so, um, yeah. I mean, we have lots of projects on iNaturalist. I I have. I can let's see. I can share. Should be able to show this. Um, let me see here. It's sharing the wrong screen. There we go. So this is the this is the Rascals project. So at the Natural History Museum, we have a lot of projects where that are led by different researchers that focus on just you know focus on documenting biodiversity across urban areas, particularly across urban areas. And the project that I developed, again, in part because I realized that to document these new introduced species like like the Mediterranean house gecko that Reese and Will Bernstein uh, discovered that we, we really need to find ways to to sort of partner with the public and that's exactly what community science is all about partnering with members of the public um, for you know to actually do uh, 
um, to address some sort of some research question. And so um, when Reese and Will submitted that photo, they submitted that to this project called Lost Lizards of Los Angeles, where we sort of had this homemade kind of website, people could upload photos. And over the roughly three years of that project, people, there was about 340 or 350 individual observations submitted to the project. And we actually published two papers as a result of those 340-ish observations. But it was mostly, it was all about lizards and it was just on LA County. And I really said, I want to expand this out to all reptiles and amphibians across Southern California. And so we developed the Reptiles and Amphibians of Southern California project, which has the acronym RASCALS. And so um, it's been out for maybe six years now. We have almost 57,000 observations. Um, those observations have been used in more than a dozen peer reviewed publications. And we're obviously still promoting, I love rascals. I still promote rascals. I absolutely want people to participate in rascals. We also have a, a project called Slime that's snails and slugs living in metropolitan environments. We have the Southern California Squirrel Survey. We have the LA Nature Map, which you basically contribute anything to. And then just maybe, I don't know, must have been only about two weeks ago, developed a new project called Widow Wars. And this is the project that I was running around the nature gardens for yesterday. So remember, I sort of started this by saying like every species in LA has an amazing story to tell. And our native black widow, the Western black widow, and the non-native, the, the introduced brown widow, which is actually an African species, they both have amazing stories to tell. So in 2003, uh, we had a project another citizen science, another community science project called uh, the Los Angeles Spider Survey, where literally people uh, caught a spider and brought it to the museum, like in a little Tupperware container, or they could even mail it to the museum. And we had this amazing, amazing, amazing volunteer by the name of Jan Kemp, who would ID these spiders. And in many cases, if they were immature, the, you wouldn't be able to see the key characters. So she would take them home and feed them and raise them up until they were adults. And you could she could see what they were. And so then she kept a tally of all these, you know, what are the common spiders that people are finding all across LA. And in 2003, as a result of that project, we found this thing called the brown widow, which had never before been documented as an established species in California. Again, it's an African species, but it's it's been introduced all over the place. It's uh, by the mid 1800s, it was in South America. It's in many parts of the Mediterranean. Uh, parts of Southern Europe. It's, it's just getting moved all over the place. It's in Hawaii now as well. Um, so in 2003, this species first shows up. And, you know, by, I don't know, 10 years ago, this is suddenly just the common widow species all across the LA area. And I mean, the rate at which these brown widows came into urban areas and largely kicked out the black widows was just astounding. And so one of the things that I got interested in thinking about was, well, what are the impacts of these brown widows on other species? So, and in particular, I got interested in this because people on the Rascals Project had uploaded photographs of um, juvenile alligator lizards, southern alligator lizards that had been ensnared in the webs of brown widows and were getting consumed by brown widows. And so I thought, you know, what, what are some of the, you know, what are these brown widows, like, what might they be doing to some of our native species? So what, what species are they even preying upon? And so we developed this Widow Wars project where we're encouraging people to you know, take their digital cameras and their smartphones and find the webs of brown or black widows. And it's really easy to tell brown and black widows apart um, just by their egg sacs. So, and that was actually one of the photos in the book is that the black widows, they have a little egg sac. It's kind of a little, it's about a little smaller. It's about the size of like your index finger nail. Um, it's, it's a very cylindrical egg sac, but it's smooth. It's like a little tiny cotton ball. And the brown widows, they have an egg sac that's about the same size, but it looks like a medieval mace. It's got like little tiny spikes all over. So basically what we're asking people to do is like, go find these widow webs. And if you see the spider, great, take a photo of the spider. If you see the egg sac, take a photo of the egg sac so we know which species of widow it is. And then look in the web and see what animals the spider has um, ensnared and preyed upon. And so like yesterday, I was walking around the nature gardens at the Natural History Museum and I was finding all these brown widows. So we can just click here. So here's a, a, a female brown widow. And I know it's a little bit hard to see. So I can zoom in a little bit, but she's, she's trapped a honeybee. And in this particular case, this one was really interesting. And I, got, I actually got lots of photos of this. Uh, 
So there's another, that's a different bee that she had ensnared. Uh, that is, I need to get uh, my colleague Lisa Gonzalez or Brian Brown in entomology to confirm. I think that that's a winged ant or maybe a winged termite that's been consumed. That's a close up of it. Um, but beneath that nest, beneath that web, excuse me. Um, so this female was eating one honeybee and there was 13 other desiccated honeybees that she had already consumed and discarded from her web on the ground beneath her. Um, and then an, a few feet away, I found another brown widow web. That one had 14 desiccated honeybees in it. Um, it had a little stink bug. Another web had a praying mantis uh, and a grasshopper. So it's just really interesting to be able to, you know, go out, take these photos and see what all they're eating. So this is what, one of the fun things about this is it's not just about brown widows and what they're eating. It's also demonstrating that you can use community science to study ecological interactions like these predator prey interactions. So although, you know, I've now contributed four observations to the project, but we have over 500 observations because we've used this crowdsourcing approach to generate lots of observations and actually all across the United States. So we actually, we're looking at the diets of all the black widow species across the US. So that's another, that's a, that's a project that we have going right now. So there's lots of projects, um, you know, at least a handful of projects that, um, that we do at the Natural History Museum that are all using this iNaturalist platform. That is so cool. Oh my goodness. 14 bees, bee carcasses, yeah. that's crazy. I actually, and I went out with a, I went out with a, um, with a broom and then I swept all the carcasses away so that when I go back, the next time I go back and do that survey, I can then see what new prey items have been picked up over the last couple of days. Right, oh my goodness, that's so interesting. Yeah, I get the widows here and I see their webs, but for some reason I'm, I don't find their prey items in them, but I'm gonna have to look harder because I wanna participate. Yeah, I mean, because once you find the widow, you can just keep going back. You know, the key right. is like, like I had to be, you have to be very careful. You know, sometimes the widow is very hidden. And so you like, I use a little stick to like kind of encourage the widow to get out where I can take a photo of it. But you don't want to disturb them that much because you don't want them aban to abandon the web. So like you can get a photo and then once you know, oh, that's a brown widow web, that's a black widow web, then you can just keep going back. And so even though there's might be no prey items, you know, one time that you go check, well, maybe two days later, there's a praying mantis or there's a, you know, there's a moth, there's a butterfly, there's, you know, a beetle. Um, right. You know, well, now I'm going to pay closer attention. So, so yeah. So for people out there, you know, you just get your phone and you install the iNaturalist app and then you can look for the Rascals Project or the Widow yeah. Forest Project. Is that right? Yep. You can, once you, I mean, the, the key thing is actually just join iNaturalist and start and start uploading photos to iNaturalist. And actually most of us who run those projects will find your observation and invite you to it. And so iNaturalist is this incredibly powerful platform, but it does have a little bit of a learning curve. And so if you start to get good at it, you can then join projects. Like you can find the projects. You can go to Widow Wars and hit join. You can go to Rascals and hit join. But at first you can just start uploading photos and probably the, the project curators will find your observation and will tag it to those projects. So, um, oh, perfect. Those ways. Yeah. yeah, my friend a um, found a Mediterranean gecko in her yard the other day. And um, she submitted it to iNaturalist and then someone got back to her and confirmed that that's what it was. So that was exciting for her. Yeah. And then I think one of the neat, like, again, like there's a story, right, where, you know, we just documented the first population of Mediterranean house geckos in LA County was, you know, not even a decade ago that we first documented that. And now we've got, I don't know, there's I, I don't know, there's well more than a dozen populations that have now popped up of this non-native gecko. Now, the good news is that gecko doesn't seem to have any real negative consequences to our native species, um, but it just highlights how rapid, like how dynamic biodiversity really is in the LA area. Like, you know, we've got the Mediterranean house gecko doing its thing. The brown widow just came through and just, just its population skyrocketed over the last 20 years. And actually right now in this year, uh, now that we started the project, I was noticing that actually there's another spider um, called the noble false widow that is actually now doing the same thing as the brown widow did. So this noble false widow, which is also, it's a really beautiful spider. It's a fairly good sized spider about the size of a, of a black widow or a brown widow. Um, but it's now just skyrocketing in numbers. If you look at iNaturalist, there's, I think something like, if you just look for LA County, um, 
just for 2020, there's something like 450 brown widow observations and there's over 300 noble false widow observations. So there's definitely, we'll see, it might be that five years from now, there's way fewer brown widows and that the noble false widow is now this really widespread species across the LA region. It's just, it's such a dynamic place in terms of biodiversity. That's so interesting. So we have a couple of questions. One is, does the brown widow have the hourglass? Yeah, um, I, I should have shown a different photo. Maybe, here, I'll cheat without sharing my screen. I think I can just pull up one of the photos I took yesterday on my phone. Yeah, so well, the, and in the meantime, I still oh, have there you go. up here and it's got, yeah. sorry, it's not the greatest angle, but the, there's the black widows and then there's the brown widow and they both have that. Hourglass, yeah, right. and so the brown widow has, um, has a more orange hourglass. So the black widow has that, you know, just striking black body. And this is only for the adults. They actually, it gets harder as you're looking at some of the subadults um, because they, they, as they age, they change color a lot. But the black widow, that nice black coloration with that beautiful red hourglass on its abdomen, the brown widow um, has an orange hourglass. And then the other thing about the brown widow is if you look at their legs, their legs at the joints are much darker. So they kind of have a lighter leg and then sort of, it's, sort of, it's almost like a striped brown and dark brown um, sort of appearance to them. So you can kind of see that in that photo. Yeah, you really can. So, and if you have the book, again, you can just flip to, what is that, what is that, 126? Yeah. Um, and you can see, you can also see the sort of, the, the spiky egg mass of the brown widow and the smooth egg mass of the black widow. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, and then we have another question, which sort, you already sort of touched on it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, this is also from Rebecca Pry. When we think about non-native species, we often see them as a negative. Are there any, are any of the non-native herbs in SoCal an exception? They're all exceptional, does that count? Um, <laughs> so, so this is great. I was, I was hoping that Rebecca was gonna be on this call. Rebecca is active on iNaturalist. She's an, an amazing community scientist. She's a live animal keeper herself. Um, and she's, she's volunteered on a number of field projects with me. Um, she's done stuff with us too. I love yeah, her. Yeah. <laughs> Yay, Rebecca. Um, so, so, so if we just, let's think just broadly about non-native species. So here's the thing. When people talk about non-native species, it's really important to realize that the vast majority of non-native species don't have any negative impacts. Some non-native species have really positive impacts, you know, at least from our perspective. So the European honeybee, that is a non-native species. That is an introduced species. But our agriculture, particularly here in California, is so dependent upon large numbers of European honeybees to pollinate lots of our crops. So there's a species that is super beneficial in an agricultural context. Now, the next time you get stung, you may have a very different view about whether they're beneficial at that particular moment. But um, so there are some that are, you know, so there are some non-native species that we can think of as beneficial. There's lots of non-native plants, of course, that we can think of as beneficial, like there's all crop plants and there's a lot, most street trees are not native, but they can at least provide shade and they can provide some habitat. Um, so there is a tiny fragment of non-native species that are what we would then think of as invasive, as causing ecological or economic harm. Um, within the non-native reptiles and amphibians that have been introduced to Southern California, I think that there's Many of those species, at least right now, we think are pretty neutral. Mediterranean house gecko, it's really dependent upon urban areas, doesn't seem to have any negative consequences that we know of so far. Romani blind snake doesn't seem to have any negative consequences that we know about right now. But then you have things like the American bullfrog. American bullfrogs can get giant. I pulled one out of Biona wetlands, uh, the freshwater marsh of Biona wetlands, which is actually, which is actually one of the field trips in the book. Um, I pulled one out of there that weighed 2.4 pounds. Like they get huge, these get monstrous. And at 2.4 pounds, that, that frog is capable of eating ducklings. It's eating baby turtles. It's eating smaller frogs. It's eating crayfish. I mean, it can eat all sorts of stuff. Anything that can fit into its mouth, it's gonna, it's gonna try to eat. So you, now the bullfrog is a really interesting situation because we knew it was, we knew it had lots of negative impacts for decades, but it wasn't until relatively recently that we also realized that it was probably moving or it was both harboring and moving around this fungus called the chytrid fungus. And so, you know, for a long time, we sort of didn't even know that that was one of its potential negative consequences. And so 
it might be the case that some of these things that I think of as being like relatively neutral, 30, 40, 50 years from now, we might have a very different take uh, because we've learned more about that particular species. And unfortunately, it is the case that a lot of the non-native reptiles and amphibians that have been introduced to Southern California do have negative consequences. So we've got things like the Italian wall lizard. Um, there's a new species. Well, the Italian wall lizard is definitely, well, the Italian wall lizard, the brown anole, the green anole, those are all established, multiple populations here in Southern California. And for all of those established populations, they kick out our native lizards. So Western fence lizards get displaced by these non-natives and um, and it's very likely that the southern alligator lizards do too. We have a smaller sample size on that. But so unfortunately, you know, there are a few, there's a few that are neutral, but there's a lot that actually in the herb side actually do have some, some ecological consequences. Um, so unfortunately, there's not, I mean, I don't know if I could say that there's any that are beneficial. I mean, there are some that provide opportunities for people to engage in you know, observations of reptiles and amphibians. And so I think there's a, there's, that's certainly a positive, but overall, I would suggest that um, there, there's not that many, you know, positive. Sorry, you guys can't see this, but since I'm talking about lizards, apparently the <laughs> cat was like, oh, you're talking about lizards. And so I need to be involved in this conversation. That's awesome. It's not a good Zoom conversation unless the cat comes in to say hi. Yeah, he just, he just had to, he had to be a part of it. Rocco, Rocco, though, as a herpetologist, of course, this this kitty is an indoor kitty who is not allowed to go outside and harm any of our local wildlife. I love it. Okay, so um, and what inspired you to study urban nature? Oh yeah, so um, my background is actually in like phylogenetics and molecular systematics. So. So I do a lot of DNA, my background is actually all in DNA sequencing and then using that information to understand how populations within one species are related to each other or how various species are related to each other. And I love that work. I really love doing that work. But when I started at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles, I realized that, that as much as I loved that work, that I had this opportunity and at some level, I think a responsibility to reframe my research in a way that I think was more advantageous for being in the LA area, was likely to involve more people. And, and I think at the time I was hopeful that it would become something that the museum would be really excited about. And of course that's, in hindsight, that's worked out really well. And so, you know, I just realized that here I am living in the California Floristic Province, living in the greater LA area, which is a major reason why this is a biodiversity hotspot. I mean, the California, over just over half the population of the California Floristic Province lives in the greater LA area. So like, this is a big chunk of the reason that we're a hotspot. And so as much as I love doing that molecular systematics and phylogenetics, I also realized that there's a lot of other people that can do that work but how many people are here in LA and can focus on you know, urban biodiversity, urban ecology, urban evolution in a place that I would argue is probably the best place in the world to be studying urban biodiversity. Like we have, not only is this a, a, a biodiversity hotspot, but we have the Natural History Museum. We have collections, you know, 35 million historical objects and specimens that speak to how biodiversity has changed in the LA area through time. And so if I'm going to be, you know, a curator, a researcher at the Natural History Museum, shouldn't I be taking advantage of that opportunity of using those historical specimens to understand biodiversity here in the LA area? And so that's really why I got into this, this urban work. And it really was that a huge chunk of me recognizing the value of community science and citizen science is that recent Will Bernstein story. It was actually that and I was on a jog one day through North Hollywood. When I first moved here, I lived in North Hollywood and I was on a jog, you know, literally just running down a, you know, a suburban street in North Hollywood. And I look up and I see a snake crossing the street in front of me and there's a car coming and I'm just, you know, even if I was a much faster runner, which wouldn't, most runners are much faster than me. Uh, but even if I was a much faster runner, I wasn't gonna get to this before the car did. Um, and I, it did get hit and when I got to it, it was still alive. And it wasn't a snake. 
I assumed it was like somebody's escaped corn snake. You know, they bought it at Petco. They didn't get a good tank, and the thing escaped a few days later. That happens all the time. I assumed it was going to be some, you know, baby non-native species, um, but it wasn't. It was actually a California legless lizard. It wasn't a snake at all. It was a legless lizard, and it just blew my mind. Like, what is a legless lizard doing in North Hollywood? And so I went and looked at the museum collections, and in fact, from like 1952 or 53, there have been a legless lizard collected about half a mile away. And so I just realized, again, just like with that gecko, I was like, what if, like, here's a native species of conservation concern. What if, what if they're still making it in certain neighborhoods in Burbank and North Hollywood? How am I, how are we ever gonna know that? Like, what's the, what's the odds that I'm gonna be running, you know, me or some other scientists are gonna be running down a street and see one, like, this never happens. There's no way this is ever gonna happen, you know? So how are we ever gonna learn about the distributions of some of those native species in urban places. And so those, that story, the legless lizard and the gecko is what basically just said, you know, it's all about, I need, I need to switch from DNA sequencing technology to starting to recognize the importance of, of smartphones as technology that allows us to study urban biodiversity. Those are great stories. Oh my goodness. Yeah, well, we're glad you're doing it. Um, and then we have a question about getting the book. Is there a special place to get it besides Amazon that you recommend or? Well, normally what I tell people to do is to come to the museum and buy it, <laughs> buy it, you know, buy it at the, um, buy it at the Natural History Museum. So I should say, you know, all profits from this book go to the Natural History Museum. Um, they don't go to, sadly, they don't go to any of, any of the authors. Um, no, it's great that it goes to the Natural History Museum. Um, if this wasn't the pandemic, I would say come visit the Natural History Museum and buy it at our gift shop. But it is the pandemic. Um, so what I would say is go visit your local bookstore. Um, if you can, if your local bookstore is open and you can do so safely, um, run to your local bookstore and do it. If you're in the Pasadena area, um, go to Vroman's. That's such an amazing um, bookstore here in the LA area. And if it's not, if you're in a situation where it's not possible, to support your local bookstore, then I would say jump onto Amazon um, and get it there. Um, Amazon, not surprisingly, will be the cheapest of all of those options. Um, but at those other places, whatever extra money you're paying is going to support either a local bookstore or the Natural History Museum. I love it. I love it. All right. Um, so I just have one final question here. Oh, well, now Rebecca's got a question too. She should be doing this interview. Rebecca, <laughs> next time I'm having you here. I love her. Okay, so she said, what is your favorite place for herping in SoCal? Oh, wow. <laughs> My favorite. Oh, that's so hard to answer. There's so many, oh, wow. Oh, there's so many different ways that I think about herping. Okay, so, oh, if I had to give one answer, oh, that's a horrible answer though, because it's like all on fire today. I absolutely love going hiking in the San Gabriel Canyon, which is like, that's, that's where the Bobcat Fire is right now. Um, the Bobcat Fire is in the West Fork of San Gabriel Canyon. So one of the things that's really interesting in the San Gabriel Mountains is that there's a, a bunch of desert species actually come up into higher elevations of the San Gabriel Mountains. And in certain spots, they cross over and you can find isolated populations in some of our coastal flowing canyons, including the San Gabriel Canyon. And so, for example, desert night lizards, there's actually populations of desert night lizards, there's populations of collared lizards. Um, there's at least two different snake species that cross over into the San Gabriel Canyon. And so, plus you can be, you can go up to some of our peaks like above 9,000 feet and you can actually find these high elevation uh, individuals of like Southern Pacific rattlesnakes at really high elevations and that's always so exciting. And so for me, like not only are those species that are exciting, but just, just like Geographically, it's so interesting. Like the biogeography of like knowing that these desert species are coming over is so fun. Finding a rattlesnake at 9,000 feet, seeing sagebrush lizards, which only occur in the upper elevations of our local mountains, is just so exciting. Plus, you know, you might be out herping and then you like look over, you know, 400, 500 meters across to some other ridge and like then there's a bighorn sheep um, and you just get to see, you know, you get to be up in these 
you know, some of the pines and the oaks. Um, and you can especially get around, you know, some of our ponderosas and some of these high elevation pines that are just so fragrant. So I don't know, that's one of my really favorite ways. But then, you know, but honestly, you know, I was out two nights ago looking for geckos in San Pedro. And, you know, that's a blast too. I have a good time doing that. But I think if you can go out for, um, I think for me, just like for amazing herping, I think getting up into the San Gabriel's just for the diversity, you know, you might see, depending on the time of year, you might see a mountain king snake, you might see, you know, a whole bunch of, a whole diversity of species. But even at low elevations, there's so much fun stuff to see. I love it. All right. Well, we are coming to the end of our time here. I just want to say thank you guys. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. This was our first interview and I think this was so much fun and I so appreciate you being a part of this with us. Um, and, and it's helping us with our mission, which is getting people to understand the local native wildlife that surrounds them better so that they can coexist and keep their pets safe also. Um, and so, so everybody that's here today, if you like this, if this was fun, like this video, because that will help everybody, right? And also subscribe, because we're doing this every Thursday at six. And if you thought this was great, you'll probably think next week is pretty great too. One Mountain Lions are oh, nice. featuring Beth Pratt. Do, do, do. So, you know, it's nothing but good times here with Turanga Ranch. Um, and Rebecca says she wishes it wasn't all on fire. And she says, thank you so much, Dana and Greg. She loved the talk. And I love the talk too. Really, you have just, this is, uh, this is awesome. I've had so much fun. Thank you again, Greg. I really appreciate this. Oh, happy to be here. Love to share LA nature stories. And I'll hopefully be here next week to hear Beth talking about amazing stories of wildlife in the LA area and across California. Yes, awesome. All right, well, thank you so much. I'm gonna end this here and, um, and we'll see everybody next week. Don't forget to subscribe.